Thank you. You know, I, again, we're continuing a series of spiritual gifts, and our our reference, uh, biblical reference, is Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8, primarily. And uh, as you know, I'm really um, I, I'm a stickler for for uh, repeating uh, because it helps us to retain. So I just want to recap this morning. I'm only going to touch on one spiritual gift, and that's the gift of uh, organization, organizing, or scriptures that. Depending on the version that you use, the Bible version, uh, it, it either say leading or organizing. Um, and in the Greek, it's the transposable. Um, but I'm a really firm believer of believers recognizing and utilizing their spiritual gift. I think it's of paramount importance to know what really drives us and that we recognize that in each other, the differences that we have in mean, our spiritual gifts and what motivates us and drives us and gives us joy in doing things. And it could be very, we could be diametrically opposed to each other in some circumstances, you know, and that's caused conflict between believers. And that's okay, we're all different, you know. God utilizes us in different capacities through our own spiritual gifts, the mo our motivational spiritual gifts that are found in chapter 12 of Romans. So, and just a quick overview and a recap, and we'll get into the, one of the other gifts. So, in his, loaded, in his letter to the, to the uh, Roman Christians, you know, Paul challenges them, challenges them to use their spiritual gifts. And he quotes, for as we have many members in one body, and all members not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members of one another. <clears throat> so, Romans 12 Verses 3 through 8 describes basic motivations which are characterized by inherent qualities or abilities within a believer. So our Creator's unique workmanship in us. Through the motivational gifts, God makes believers aware of needs He wants to meet through us for His glory. Then believers can minister to others through the ministry and manifestation gifts of the Spirit. And what I mean by manifestation gifts, I don't want anybody to to misunderstand. Uh, what I simply mean by that is when we're exercising our spiritual, motivational spiritual gifts and the capacity or the administration of it, whatever God has provided us the venue to do that, and primarily it's within the church, then God's spirit manifests the results of it. It's outside of our control, outside of our power. It, it, I would equate that to how does somebody get saved simply by hearing the gospel. It's unexplainable. It's the power of God unto salvation. Okay? It's through the sacrifice of his Christ, our Savior, the Son of God, who willingly gave himself for us. And God said it, he was pleased by the foolishness of the preaching of the word for people to be saved. Okay? That's the inherent power of God. So when, we're in, when we exercise our motivational gifts within the body of Christ, within whatever the capacity God has enabled us or blessed us with in, in, within the church and sometimes outside of the church depending on your circumstances or job if you will God gives a supernatural outcome of it it's outside of our control we're simply doing what he blessed us with a motivational gift exercising it and not in the capacity that he has given us and then God gives the results the supernatural, and I call it the manifestation gift because it's a gift to us and it's a gift to those around us also. So that's why I call this manifestation gift. God manifests himself in a supernatural way beyond our control or abilities. So believers can minister to others through the ministry manifestation gifts of the Spirit. Again, ministering, we're simply doing what we're supposed to be doing. Okay, ministering, and then God uses the outcome of that to minister to others, as well as to us. So, a Christian's motivational spiritual gift represents what God does in us to shape our perspective on life and motivate our words and actions. So, the gifts mentioned here in Romans chapter 12 are seven motivational spiritual gifts. And again, we're just recapping here. Each Christian receives one at the time of salvation and it is the tool through which God works in us to see needs and to do something to meet them. These gifts equip believers to take a vital role in the church. 
And again, the gifts that are mentioned there, probably know them by heart by now, but prophecy, teaching, serving, ed exhortation, giving, organization, and mercy. So as I mentioned, the spiritual gifts are drives, opportunities, and results that are given by the Holy Spirit to achieve God's spiritual goals. And every Christian is given a motivation spiritual gift that is activated at salvation when the Holy Spirit is united with our spirit. In Romans 8, verses 16 and 17, we see that, that we have a sonship. He says we are our heirs and that we are his children once we are born again spiritually and into his family. So it is very important that we discover that spiritual gift so that we can work through it and God can work through us in accomplishing it. The more we understand spiritual gifts, the more we will understand how to demonstrate Christ's love. And last week I had a handout with a, it looked, it looked like a lampstand and I had put the seven gifts, organized them and I put them in kind of in where the greatest opposition to one is across the chart. Like for example, prophecy and mercy. Uh, organ, uh, a, a teacher and an exhorter. So, but there's different variations of that. You know, there's different blinds of that. But those are the most obvious ones. And we gave some examples last week. So, you know, we will always have believers that will irritate us. It's unavoidable. You know, that was mentioned. We need to recognize that we are different. You know, and we, we have different mo motivational drives and our, our spiritual gifts, our motivational spiritual gifts differ from one another. Sometimes they'll clash, but we need to understand that, that neither one of us are wrong. We're both right, and I keep mentioning that over and over again, just to cause us to understand this. So we need to be able to get along. And I also mentioned that a leader, a spiritual leader, a pastor, or whatever, if they're able to surround themselves with people that have different, these different viewpoints, they have different motivational gifts, they will, he will have, they will have some very wise counsel. And the more we understand spiritual gifts, the more we will understand how to demonstrate Christ's love. And so every one of us will see life through our own particular spiritual gift. We will see things someone with a different gift won't see. And of course, sometimes you know how it is. Uh, You'll, say, you'll be saying to yourself, what is wrong with this person? Now, why can't they see this where it's clear as day to me? And they're thinking the same thing with you. So there are a lot of tensions, even in families, that can be resolved if you can just understand what your spiritual gift is. You know, and we have a need for the other six gifts. Not one believer has all seven gifts. Now, mind you, you, you have a, we all have a primary motivational spiritual gift. However, that does not mean you don't have a drive from other gifts also. They're not as powerful and not overwhelming. It's not the main driving force that gives you the greatest joy when you exercise it and you will do it tirelessly. But, you know, some people that have a gift of uh, organization or teaching have a gift of, you know, I like to be, like to exhort people. Somebody has a gift of prophecy, likes, has an underlying gift that likes to teach, you know? And so there's, there could be, there's more than one. People like, this is what I've observed. And most people do have more than one that they like to be involved with. There's one predominant one that absolutely drives us. It gives us the greatest joy when we exercise it. And the way we discover that is, is we get involved. We help people, we help each other in a church. That's what the Lord expects of us. That's why we're here, you know, to, to, to help each other. And when you start doing that in whatever capacity, whatever God leads you, and pray about that. Pray that God will lead you to help in whatever capacity. And he will. God answers prayer. And he's our father. That's what he expects. He wants to hear from us. You know, he wants to use us in this life. And he wants to use us to help and edify the body of Christ. And so you will discover what really drives you. And I assure you, you will plug into one of these seven motivational gifts. 
And another way I mentioned before is, which is a very powerful way to determine what, if you're not sure what your motivational spiritual gift is, look at the handouts I gave and look what the abuses are and the shortcomings and of, your, of that spiritual gift. It's, people find it very easy to identify with that. Yeah, this is what I'm doing wrong, or this is what I've done wrong, you know, and yeah, that makes sense to me. So now you can plug in that way also. Paul's whole ministry was exercising his spiritual gift, and it was the grace of God within him. In 1 Corinthians 15, 10, he says, I am what I am by the grace of God. And in Romans 12, and verses 3 through 9, the word grace is mentioned three times, and that's our reference that we use for this series. And God loves to give grace to every one of us. If nothing else, this should give us a whole new perspective and appreciation and self-work. You know, there's still Christians that don't recognize their standing in Christ that we have. You know, and I have observed when I was a younger, younger man how when somebody discovers what their gift is and actually plugs into it and sees how God is using them to bless others, that, that will change a person entirely. Their self-image, their self-confidence, their self-worth. When they recognize that, you know, they're not just another person in this world, but they have a specific gift that God is using them to utilize and bless others with. That really helps young people, what I've observed. It really will transform a young person's life, especially. Now, I just want to briefly talk about we talked about the motivation. I just want to briefly discuss the administration of it, which is when the capacity that God has enabled us to, to exercise our spiritual gift. Like, for example, I'm up here today sharing with you, okay? The pastor preaches, others teach, Dr. Marika teaches, you know? We have people that serve in different capacities in this church, okay? This is whatever the venue is that God has allowed us to actually share with the body of Christ through our motivational gift. And so in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 7, in particular, this is referencing there, and in particularly verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 12, it says that, that there are different administrations. And the Greek word there is diakonia, which we know come, we transliter translate it to the English, deacons, which it, it simply means to minister unto. So, it's talking about the spiritual gifts there in chapter 12, and it's specifically mentioning diakonia, ministering. This is all that we're doing. We're ministering, we're exercising spiritual gift in whatever capacity in the ministry aspect of it. It could be anything. When I say ministry, I don't mean preaching. It could be anything. And this refers to the ministry gifts given to by the church. And whatever the church is, you, whatever your function, you, you may be functioning within a capacity within the church. So regardless of what your motivational gift is, you can have one or more of these ministry gifts in the church. You know, we have people here that are involved in doing more than one thing in the church. God wants the church to do a lot more than just church leaders realize as part of the church function today. I think we're stuck in a rut with church, you know, and uh, some churches are trying to entertain everybody to death, you know, to attract people to come. You know, when we narrow down the scope and ministry of the church, we narrow down its effectiveness in the world today. And so God has given all these seven gifts so that the church becomes dynamic in the world. And one thing I want to mention here, when, when the church allowed the government welfare to the populace, that's when we started losing influence in America. The churches should be the responsible party in helping people and reaching out. Okay. Because if not, and we've lost the influence that we have in, in America because of that. One of the goals we should have is to see the church rediscover the great potential of influencing a community and a whole nation by the gifts operating through it. 
And now I'd like to talk about the manifestation of operations. We, motivational gift, exercising it, diaconia, administration, and operations, or manifestation, if you will. And this is also 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 7. Now in verse 6, the Greek word there is energema, which it translates, we know as energy, which is actually pretty remarkable in my opinion, because it's God who gives the manifestation of it. It's through his energy, it's through his power. And, and in verse 7, phanerosis is used. It's, it's, it, it's a word in Greek that means to come to show, it, to show up. It just appears. God manifests his energy and he shows up. When we're just doing what we know we should be doing in whatever capacity God has in, in, enabled us into and empowered us to. So it is not by our power or might, it is by the Holy Spirit, by His energy, that these gifts are effective. We're just simply recognizing where we are, which is our motivational gift, exercising it, and God brings the manifestation of it and the blessings. So this is what the Holy Spirit does once we exercise our motivational gift or our ministry gift. And so the Holy Spirit brings all kinds of the results, and it's up to Him, not up to us. So we are commanded to be transformed to the image of Jesus Christ. One of our purposes must be to find that just what our spiritual gift is so that God can fully use us as his vessels to bring glory to him and bring along others into his kingdom. Let us, uh, let's look at the handout, which is the gift of organizing, of organization or leading. I'm just going to read along for the most part. So a person with the motivational gift of organizing is able to accomplish tasks and solve problems through analysis and delegation. An organizer often discerns the talents and abilities of others and knows how those individuals can best serve within a ministry or on a particular project. I think we all know people like that. And we have a biblical example of that is perfect is the Apostle Paul. When the Apostle Paul and his fellow missionaries brought the gospel, uh, actually to Lydia, Paul and his, and his meeting with Lydia. When Paul and his fellow missionaries brought the gospel to Philippi, a woman named Lydia heard them preach and responded with faith in God. As a business, business owner and persuasive woman of faith, Lydia used her resources to help meet Paul's needs and she welcomed the missionaries into her home. And the reference in that is Acts 16:15. And I'll quote it. When she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Let's look at some general characteristics of somebody with the spiritual gift of organization. An organizer's basic motivational drive is to lead others to get a project done. He is able to solve problems and accomplish tasks through analysis and delegation. The organizer leads others to complete projects. He might not necessarily do the job, but through organization and delegation, he makes sure the job gets done. A person with the gift of organizing has the ability to discern the strengths, weaknesses, and talents of others. When a project is launched, the organizer does not focus on how the job can be done, but rather on who can do it best. As a general rule, organizers tend to judge spirituality, including their own on the basis of accomplishment. And they evaluate accomplishment on the basis of doing the best job with the fewest resources in the shortest amount of time. They are masterful at making long range goals. Organizers always see the big picture. They can look past today's circumstances and see where the group needs to be tomorrow or next week or next year. Organizers are willing to take whatever time is needed to do the job well. Organizers are goal-oriented, and sometimes an organizer's goals may not match with everyone else's goals. For example, if the goal is to construct a water tank, the organizer will oversee the construction of an efficient, sturdy water tank, but it may not be an attractive water tank. 
However, the goal to build a functional water tank would be accomplished. If the goal had been to construct an attractive water tank, the organizer would have focused on that goal. An organizer is even keeled. It takes a lot to ruffle his feathers. He sees emotional expressions, good or bad, as a waste of time. Now you can see I would conflict with somebody with the gift of mercy. Although organizers are designed to lead, they don't always have the personality of an obvious leader. Therefore, they can easily go unnoticed when the need for a leader arises and the job will frequently be given to an aggressive prophet or server. You know, you would think that somebody that can manage, can take a project, regardless of the size, lead it to its conclusion and get it done well, would actually be the first one to, to volunteer. But that's not, that's not the case. They typically, they'll sit back and just observe and maybe get involved in the project, but somebody has to allocate that responsibility to the organizer. That's a very typical application of that spiritual gift. They're not in the forefront. They'll do it, and they'll get it done if they're allocated to that position. An organizer's strengths. Let's look at that for a minute. An organizer is efficient, thorough, and loyal. An organizer invests his time wisely. Since he measures spirituality by the accomplishment of tasks, crossing them off his list as fast as possible, to him, to waste time is to be un, an unprofitable servant, as we see in Luke 17, verses 7, 7 through 10. God gave organizers thick skin. They patiently address the frustrations of their workers, and they can handle pressure extremely well. Even if he is misunderstood, he will press on toward the goal. They seem to be able to implement the impossible and use the unusable. He delegates in order to achieve maximum efficiency, not as a means to express favoritism or avoid work. An organizer makes decisions based on what is best for the sake of the project, not what is most convenient for the laborers. As a result of his God-given ability to discern true character, an organizer can quickly recognize a sloth and remove him from the team if necessary. <clears throat> Probably most of us here have known somebody like that. And, and that is one of my strengths also, having been in business and having you know, um, people working for me and in other capacities that I've served before. Let's look at an organizer's weaknesses. And again, you may be sitting here and you may be able to plug into these weaknesses, recognize, you know what, that's my weakness, okay? But that will tell you, to give an indication, you know what, this is probably your spiritual gift. Because of their need to constantly be conquering new mountains, organizers can easily frustrate others who do not share their vision. Family members or coworkers may interpret the organizer's insatiable desire to plan ahead as a reflection of discontentment, which is not actually the case. On his priority list, he tends to put projects before people. The organizer tends to take an interest in others in order to find out the best way to use them rather than the best way to serve them. People tend to feel used and discarded when their usefulness is over. He sees unnecessary expressions of emotion, good or bad, as a waste of time. This can earn him the reputation of being cold-hearted or unconcerned. This is not actually true, however. The organizer is simply pre preoccupied with tasks and not with feelings. As a result of their focus on a big picture, organizers often to be uninvolved and or uninterested. And rather than accepting responsibility if something goes wrong, immature organizers will delegate the blame to not just the work assignments. Okay, we will end there. And um, if anybody has any questions or they want to talk to me afterwards about it, please feel free. You know, um, I know when I was first 
exposed to this and studying it, it really had a profound effect on me. It just caused me to just to leap, you know, forward, you know, in his service. And uh, I'm hoping this will help some of us here or somebody else that you know. Thank you.